Hey there TPS fans, Aaron here, and you're probably wondering, who the heck is Aaron? Well, I'm TPS's newest addition, and I'm here to bring you a new segment called Oh Yeah They Did That, where we look back at some of the craziest feats in sports that you may have forgotten all about. Feel free to drop me a line in the comments section, let me know how you like the new segment, or just tell me how great my voice sounds. In our first video, we talked about Terrell Davis, the Denver Broncos running back that played blind in the Super Bowl and somehow still brought home the MVP honors. Then it was Thomas Davis, the linebacker who, when he was a member of the Carolina Panthers, dislocated his finger during the middle of a play, only to pop it back in and take down one of the toughest running backs in league history, Marshawn Lynch. Both daring feats, yes. But both of the aforementioned occurrences strangely pale in shock value when you compare it to what happened during a contract negotiation that left an NFL player out of over $8 million. And it was all because his agent left him hanging with the free agency deadline approaching, and the player couldn't figure out how to get the fax machine working on time. Now, at this point, some of you may be wondering who we could possibly be talking about, and with good reason. It seems unimaginable that such a blunder could take place in today's technology-rich era of football, right? I mean, surely this must be an instant from the dark days before digital when everything was dial-up and dial tones, right? Well, guess what? We're not gonna give you the answer that easily. Well, what fun would that be? We've got to let you work for it a little. Oh, but don't worry, we're also gonna help break it down for you. So play along and see if you can guess who it is. Okay, so what do we know about this mystery NFL player who, despite being a seven year NFL vet at the time of the incident and having an agent working for him that had been in the business for well over 15 years, managed to miss out on millions of dollars because of a faxing snafu? Well, it is a tricky one. After all, there are thousands of contract negotiations every year, so the options at the moment are endless. Because of that, we might have to take a little bit of initiative here to help narrow it down. Here we go. Hint number one. The player in question did his bidding on the defensive side of the ball, primarily as a pass rusher coming off of the edge, either as a defensive end or occasionally lining up as a linebacker. And here's another big hint. Despite being rather undersized for the position, standing at just 5 foot 11 inches, but a sturdy 260 plus pounds, the player in question is a five-time pro bowler and a two-time first team all-pro selection. How about he earned his first Pro Bowl selection while he was a member of the team that the famous fax incident took place with, the Denver Broncos, and the second incident occurred while he was playing for the team that capitalized on his dastardly contract situation, scooping him up before the 2013 NFL season, the Baltimore Ravens. Okay, so you must have been able to narrow it down a little bit at this point. The player went from the Broncos to the Ravens in 2013 and played defensive end. Ringing any bells? Any memories of the fearsome pass rusher that was taken out of the University of Louisville in the fourth round of the 2006 NFL Draft by NFL legend Mike Shanahan? All right, enough is enough. Without further ado, our contract faxing aficionado is none other than the recently retired Elvis Dumerville. Like I said, Dumerville was taken 126 overall in the 2006 draft by the Denver Broncos. Denver was fortunate to have Dumerville drop so far in the draft, as many other teams were spooked by his size. The fact that he was taken so late is actually pretty important to the story for two reasons. The first being because Dumerville was not some highly touted blue chip prospect. He was expected to be taken in the draft, but the top tier agents don't come lining up for fourth round draft picks. So, Dumerville was subjected to enlisting the services of Martin Majid, who had recently left an established agency to start up his own practice. Now, to be fair, it's not like Majid was some hack, but this breakdown in communication, if that's what you want to call it, did ultimately get him suspended by the NFL Players Association. So, he certainly did have some culpability in the whole situation, and deserves some of the blame. Secondly, because Dumerville was taken in the fourth round, his first contract in the NFL was very modest. I mean, during that 2009 season, the one in which he earned his first All-Pro selection, which was first team honors, by the way, he was making just $535,000 in salary. Although this may seem like a hell of a salary compared to the regular folk out there, for first team All-Pro production in the NFL, that is pennies on the dollar. 
and it is a big part of why he received such a massive raise following his breakout year. The following two seasons, he pulled in 19.6 million and 14 million respectively, as a part of what was supposed to be a five-year, $58.3 million extension. But that deal was agreed to in July of 2010 when the Broncos were coming off of a disappointing 2009 campaign in which they started off the season 6-0 only to lose 8 of their next 10, resulting in the team missing the postseason. Furthermore, the team was built around quarterbacks like Kyle Orton and subsequently Tim Tebow, both of whom were a far cry from the legendary quarterback that Denver brought in next, Peyton Manning. But just as Tebow and Orton were pedestrian in their performance when compared to the likes of Peyton Manning, so was their price tag. And Denver really mortgaged the farm in 2012 to make Manning a Bronco, inking him to a five-year, $96 million deal. For a frame of reference, Tebow made just over $8 million in the two years in Denver, and Kyle Orton raked in $3.8 million. So, needless to say, there were some pretty serious reallocations of funds that the Broncos accounting team needed to orchestrate after signing Manning. And restructuring some of the team's existing contracts was a big part of that. Although you might think that most guys would be rather peeved about taking pay cuts, for the most part, they all understood that bringing Manning into the fold gave the team a small but very real window to contend for a Super Bowl. The team owed Doomerville $12 million in 2013 and explained to him that they pretty much had to release him unless he took a pay cut. To be clear, the Broncos still wanted him in navy blue and orange. After all, the then 29-year-old had recorded 11 sacks the previous season and had led the league with 17 in 2010. But when it came to cleaning up the books for Doomerville, it got to the point that it was either sign on the dotted line or you're out. Being the team first guy and the winning focus competitor that Doomerville was, he didn't want to jump ship right as the team was getting good. At the same time, he had a family to feed and had to look out for himself. So the negotiations between the two sides dragged on a little bit. Probably more than either side wanted to, but the mutual interest never wavered. And as far as both parties were concerned, a deal was going to get done. It was just a matter of time. Unfortunately, time, like their salary restrictions, had a hard cap. Friday, March 15th at 4 p.m. And somehow, despite having finally agreed to taking $8.5 million from the Broncos for the upcoming 2013 season, word never got to the Broncos on time. And they were forced to cut Doomerville to avoid taking the $12.5 million cap hit, taking a $5 million hit instead. Now, if you're wondering how in the world this could happen, with all that was at stake for a team and player poised to go on a Super Bowl run together, don't worry, you're not alone. Shoot. I'd bet that both Doomerville and the Broncos are still wondering how this one fell through the cracks. But we'll do our best to piece this whole thing together for you. That 4pm deadline we were talking about? That was for the team to submit any restructured contracts, meaning that the documents had to be sent into the league office before that point. And as the story goes, somewhere around 3.30pm on that Friday, Doomerville and Majid came to the realization that the market for pass rushers had cooled substantially in recent years. Considering the fact that Michael Bennett, coming off of a 9-sack season in Tampa Bay, was only able to ink a one-year, $5 million deal from Seattle. Because of this, Doomerville and his agent agreed to that $8 million figure from Denver. So, the principle of the deal wasn't the problem, but instead, the location of the parties in question. Majid was in his Philadelphia office, Doomerville was at his off-season residence in Miami, and of course, the Broncos were headquartered in Denver. According to John Elway, the Broncos team president, our deadline was clearly communicated to Elvis's representative at 3pm EST. We were informed by Elvis's representative that he declined our offer. We then prepared Elvis's termination notice to officially file his release with the NFL office. Sounds cut and dry, right? Nope. He continued to explain. At approximately 325 EST, however, we were informed that Elvis changed his mind and accepted the same contract we proposed nearly two and a half hours earlier. Although we expressed our concern regarding the time constraints, we were assured that the signed documents would be submitted to us before the league's waiver deadline. We did not receive the documents from Elvis by the league's deadline and were forced to release him shortly before 4 p.m. EST. Majid was steadfast in his claim that he hadn't received the renegotiated document from the Broncos until 3.45 p.m. and that he had instructed Dumerville to wait by a fax machine so that he could receive the new contract, sign it, and send it back. Explaining to USA Today Sports, it's terrible, but he said he knows what happened 
happened and why it happened. Reportedly, Doomerville signed the contract and hustled into town to send it out. But by the time he got to the Kinkos and faxed a document to the Broncos, it was too late. They had already filed for termination in order to avoid the sizable cap hit. The Broncos reportedly didn't receive the signed contract until 4.06 p.m. And while this may seem like a pretty arbitrary deadline, the NFL is very serious about such deadlines. And even when the Broncos appealed to the league office, pleading with them to honor the verbal agreement that the two parties had reached before the deadline, the NFL had zero inclination to budge. All this happened on a Friday before the new league year kicked off. And unsurprisingly, come Saturday, Doomerville was no longer a client of Martin Majid. Despite wanting to continue his career as a Bronco, the two sides were at a stalemate. Denver had already allocated $5 million towards Doomerville in the form of a dead cap hit that came from terminating him. So the $8 million offer was long gone. Fortunately for Doomerville, he did end up getting $8.5 million from the Baltimore Ravens for the 2013 season as a part of a five-year $26 million deal. But he did miss out on the Broncos' two subsequent Super Bowl runs. All in all, just a crazy story. You can simply never underestimate the impact of human error. Do you have any ideas for a crazy sports story we should talk about? Join us in the comment section below. If you like this video and learned a thing or two, clicking the like button helps us out a ton, and we appreciate it. If this is your first time coming to TPS though, subscribing is a great idea because we put out videos like this every single day. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.